to um, Michigan State University Board of Trustees, Dr. Simon, the Provost, Athletic Director Mark Hollis, student athletes and my honorees here this evening. I am deeply honored to be here. Before I give my presentation, I gotta say two things. When Mark Hollis called me, we have a Bible study in my basement every Wednesday morning from 6.45 until about nine o'clock. It was seven o'clock in the morning, the phone is ringing. Who, I said, who in the world could they be calling me? <laughs> At seven o'clock in the morning. Clarence, congratulations. I said, for what, Mark? What did I do? <laughs> well, it's been a highlight of my life, and I'm still trying to overcome it. I didn't know what they might present tonight on me. And I worked on two different stories, but I'm going to give the one that really supports what was said up there tonight. I think that might be my best one. And that is, someone called me one day and said, uh, Dr. Underwood, tell me something. Why are you being inducted into the Hall of Fame? What did you do? You weren't an All-American football player. And you certainly was, wasn't a coach. I've been there 40 years. I haven't seen you on the football field or the soccer field. What are you doing? How did they get you in there? Well, tonight I want to see if I can ask that question, Mark. I may need a couple more minutes, but I'm going to ask that question if you don't mind. But I want to go back to when I was 13 years of age in Alabama, in a segregated society, segregated schools. Blacks and whites couldn't socialize together. And my dad worked for a llama company. He was a fireman where he shoveled coal and sawdust into a furnace that transmitted heat to another part of that unit to dry wet lumber for commercial purposes. So when I turned 13 years of age, I should never forget it. In the summertime, my mother would ask me to take my daddy's lunch to him every day. And I would be a mile and a half from my house. And when I arrived with my daddy's lunch, he would always ask me, son, he said, I want you to stay here and help me work. That was the worst words I've heard in my life. <laughs> because, you see, I was very athletically. And so I could think about all of my friends in the creek swimming or in the road street playing some kind of ball game or they'd be on somebody's porch drinking Kool-Aid and playing card games. And there I was in the hot furnace room helping my dad shovel coal and sawdust into the furnace. I hated it. I didn't hate my dad, but I hated the work I was doing. I did not realize what my mother and my father were trying to teach me until I graduated from high school and went into the military services. And what I found a sawmill to be, for example, long hours. There was work I didn't like. And they taught me in the Army, I faced the same thing in the military services, long hours, a lot of hard work and discipline. My father taught me that you need to do your work before play. And no matter how long or hard the work might be, it never hurts you. Just keep doing it. And the third thing he taught me vicariously was, you must have discipline in your life. I didn't have any at that time. I was going to play sports, get outside, run, and play sports. And I carried those three principles, too, when I came to MSU as a student. And then in 1969, I was called from the Michigan Department of Education to serve MSU in the Department of Athletics as the assistant ticket manager. And they were going to build a Breston Center. And I would have a part of that. Build a Breston Center on student fees, but the students defeated that. And so I returned to the Michigan Department of Education. And then in 1972, they called me back, this time with a real job. Assistant Director of Athletics in charge of Student Athlete Support Services. I didn't really know what that job entailed, but I came with wide-eyed, as I always, always have, and I took that job. And what that job entailed was a one-man's office and a secretary. 
keeping 600 male student athletes eligible for their sports. Women at that time was not integrated into the NCAA. They came a few years later. Now that in itself would give you Hall of Fame honors. <laughs> and, then, and then on top of that, I have to make sure they graduated. We had a poor graduation rate here among primarily black athletes and rural athletes. So I had to make sure, met with the assistant deans, make sure they had made progress towards their degree, degrees and graduated. And we improved the graduation rate significantly. Keep track of that financial aid to make sure that they did not, for example, go against the grain of the NCAA, the Big Ten Conference, and them MSU's policies. And pretty soon I noticed something. The patterns start flowing toward me. Every time an athlete deviated from normal life or stepped the wrong way, the coach would refer them to me on the back end to resolve the problem. And I said, this is not right. I mean, I can't resolve, after you have messed up, I can't resolve that part. So I got to get on the front end. I got to make sure I protect them, prepare programs for them to keep them from getting in trouble. And so I met with MSU Police Department. I met with the East Lansing Police Department. And we developed seminars for all student athletes. And we talked about, for example, sexual behavior, abuse and alcohol and drugs, fighting, and other social issues that young people might get involved in that would cause them and their parents and university trouble. We did that for years to make sure they changed their behavior. And we didn't have a lot of things at that time. Then they put on the meme besides what I was doing already, one man shop, we want you to help write the Title IX proposal. Make sure that women's integrated into the NCAA as well as MSU and other parts of the country. On top of that, I wrote the first book in the nation according to the records of the NCAA on the role of student athletes on a university campus. I sponsored the first conference in the nation to other athletic advisors like myself how to advise student athletes. And two days before it was scheduled to start, we were hit with the NCAA violation package. So the president called me and said, Clarence, I need you over in my office, not with that thing you have already organized. So I had to send telegrams out to cancel the conference, but four people came here anyway. Four showed up. Myself and the other person from Penn State, we formed an organization called the National Athletic Academic Advisors Association. Started with two people. Today, there are 1,700 people, members of that organization, and it's still growing. <laughs> One of the best things I've ever done in my whole life, one, probably the second thing, is to enroll in Michigan State University. No man is an island. As much as I try to do to help our athletes, keep them out of trouble, keep them focused on getting a degree and being somebody in life, I didn't do it alone. I had support from the president's office, to the provost's office, to the deans and the assistant deans, and all the directors and people in my department, athletic department. I had support. What I proposed to them that was thought about and was right, we did it. And so I want to tell these young people today about three things that my father never told me but taught me. Number one is that work comes before play. You've heard that so many times in your life, but I'm going to tell you for your entire life, working life, work comes before play. If you want to be successful in life, you must do the work first. Number two, 
And that is, work does not hurt you. When I was the one-man shop, I took work home every night. My wife told me, she said, Clarence, I think you're married to your work, not me. <laughs> Long hours and work does not hurt anyone. And the third thing, you must have discipline in your life. I saw so many young men in the Army who couldn't perform correctly because they didn't have discipline. They stayed in trouble. They got in jail. All kind of dirty work because they didn't have discipline in their life. Now, what is discipline in the first place? It is doing the right thing. It is doing things day by day that will help you to improve your skills and be a better person. For example, I'll give you three, four examples very quickly. An athlete that practices every day his or her sport to become better. That's discipline. A musician who uses horns or other organs to get better with their fingers and their mouth and how they blow things and all that, that's discipline. A dancer, that's discipline. Every life, day in your life, you should prepare how to improve your life. Reading every day is a discipline. I saw so many young people in this world who don't have discipline. And I'll guarantee you one thing, they will struggle all their lives trying to be somebody and be successful in life. I want to thank you, students. You got a great opportunity. What I do now, my part-time work at MSU, I work for the admissions office. And I talk to incoming prospective high school students about what it takes to come to MSU and be successful in life. And I know what I'm talking about. If you carry those three principles with you, I will guarantee you, you'll be highly successful in life. Thank you so very much. Thank you.